And one thing I've always said, what has happened to the estuaries all over Florida, if it were to happen overnight, what's happened over the past 30 years, we would have had all kinds of money because the government would have came in. It would, it's an environmental disaster that's taken 45, 50 years to happen. But if you were to step back in time and then come to the right to today, you would be like, why in the hell did you let this happen? That's what I say. Why did we let this happen? What's up, everybody? Captain Blair Wiggins here from Addicted Fishing, sitting in on Tom Rowland's podcast. I've always been a fan of our next guest. He's Blair Wiggins. He's the Mogan man. Addictive Fishing. That's a great show that's been on the air for a long, long time. He came out swinging with a show that was different than all others. It had quick edits, and it was action-packed. The music was different. Everything was different about this show. Caught my eye right away. He also did a lot of things to incorporate community into what he does, which I always appreciated very much. And now, to commend him even further, Blair saw an environmental problem and actually stopped complaining and took action. And that is something that we can all do. Not all of us have the clout that Blair Wiggins does to get something like this off off the ground very quickly, but we can all stop complaining and we can all take action. And that's what Blair did. And I commend him for that. We're going to learn all about his project to help to restore the water quality in Mosquito Lagoon and other places with a natural a natural filter, the clam. So uh, this was a fast, fantastic conversation, a great podcast, uh, not only about the clams, but about Blair's history and what, what makes him tick. And uh, really cool guy. I hope you enjoy this one with my friend, Blair Wiggins, the Mogan Man. Blair Wiggins. What is happening? Man, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. Glad to be here. Glad to be able to tell everybody about a clam or two. You're a busy, uh, you're a busy guy here at the ICAST show. You've been, uh, you've been here doing this new project about clams. Yep. Kind of jumped into it uh, two years ago. I was doing a tagging program with Lisa Fitzgerald from the CCA and went to my home waters of Mosquito Lagoon. And, you know, I'd, I'd fished there, you know, growing up my whole entire life. And the grass flats were absolutely incredible. And we went to an area where I'd normally kind of go and catch 40 or 50 redfish any given time of my life. And uh, we went to certain spots and fished for two days, and we caught two redfish. Wow. 16 inches. And there was no grass on the flats. The water was dirty. I mean, it was just, it, it looked like a cesspool. And like, uh, with all the government studies that have been done, the studies, doing the studies, studying the studies, and all the money that they've raised, nothing has been done to the Indian River Lagoon system, at least to two years ago. Uh, when I when we went out with Lisa, I just I told her, I said, so we got to do something. What can we do? And she, I told her basically my ideas and what I observed my whole life growing up, and that's, you know, the clams coming out, and the more clams come out of the river, basically, the worse the water got. And then we had the freeze in 2010 that really devastated uh, basically the whole state of Florida and the snook population that killed the redfish, all of our big 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 pound trout that we had in Mm -hmm. Mosquito Lagoon. Just wanted to do something. You know, I've, I've, you know, made my living off the Indian River and basically the estuaries of Florida and wanted to do something to put back in because I've seen it go downhill. I mean, just degrading. uh, And it seems like it's doing, doing it, you know, tenfold what it was doing 10 years ago. So, what do you think that is causing that? To be perfectly honest, stupid people, because they let, we have such a small estuary in the Indian River Lagoon system. Back in the 90s, they let uh, commercial clamors come in from all over the United States where they have devastated their co- clam populations. And they came in, and you, you know as well as I do what happens when commercial fisheries come in to a small area. They devastate it. I mean, there's, there's, there's no denying it because... You know, I saw it firsthand. I've seen it with the fisheries when, you know, when redfish, you're allowed to keep those in the gill nets when I was a kid. The more gill nets that came in the water, the more fish were gone. And just like when they had 10,000 clamors out there in the river, raking it with, you know, two foot long steel rakes and ripping up all the grass. And they're claiming they're not ripping up grass. But every morning when I'd get up and go to the uh, boat ramp, there'd be grass everywhere. And you could tell it's been dug up by the roots and the clamors. 
But uh, I saw probably two to three million clams come out of that river a day. Wow. There was literally 10,000 boats on the Indian River Lagoon system and everybody out there raking the clams and we're tearing up the bottom. And uh, when the clamor started disappearing, that's when the water just started degrading, getting worse and worse and worse. And, and so it, the clamors are disappearing because there are no more clams? Yep. They've fished it out and they're they're moving on to another place? Moving on to another place. And what happened is when I've learned so much about clams working with Whitney Labs, University of Florida, and those guys up there that clams have to have a certain number in a certain in an area to reproduce, to uh, s- sustainability is what they were telling me. And if you don't have enough clams in there, they're never going to bounce back and recover. And they've just, it's just been degrading ever since the clamors left. And uh, what we're doing, we're working with, uh, with CCA, FWC, University of Florida, Whitney Labs, Todd Osborne up there is incredible, uh, you know, a clam scientist. And they got a guy, Jose, up there. He's basically the clam whisperer. He does the breeding and the, the spawning of them. But what they did, they came down to uh, to south end of Mosquito Lagoon, and they got like 24 big breeder clams. Uh, four or five of them were good female clams, and they were able to spawn. And we've done two spawns with those clams now and come up with 6 million clams. Wow. The first 40,000 clams we put in the water two or three weeks ago. I think it was like three weeks ago, we put them in the water, put them in bags, and they're up in the Matanzas River right now growing. And as soon as they get up to about a thumbnail size, we'll take them, transport them back down to the Indian River. And yeah, that's but, what I was going to ask. Like, when you when you have this millions of clams, how big are they? Like a pinhead? It's like beach sand. Okay. I, I, in, a, in a little vial about, you know, just a little time, like a, a lipstick vial. And how long is it going to take them to get to a thumbnail? Uh, it's about six to eight months. Okay. But they, I held a million and a half clams in a little tiny vial the other day, and it was just—it looked like dust in there, and dust wow. in water. And it was—it was pretty interesting to see how they were. And you—you know—you pick them up, and it feels just like beach sand. You have a million clams in your hand, and it just gritty, just like beach sand at Playland Beach is what it felt like. Wow. So, what is, do you know? The survival rates of those million that's, clams, or I mean, that's, this, that's what this money it's is. The going wild, to. wild west yeah. right now, right? It's the wild, well, what they've done, like I said, the, the the clams that they've done with the six million that we've spawned already. Uh, the first three million, they've taken the, the tip-top clams out of those that grow the fastest, look the healthiest, have the thickest shells, and want just the healthiest clams out of that botch, batch, and they put those in the water, and they use those to rebreed because you can't introduce a, a different species or a different genetic clam like a Louisiana clam. You couldn't right. bring one of those here. I was wondering, like, well, those are the healthiest clams in the world. You know, they're in that polluted water. They'd be great for here. But there's certain uh, bacteria and organisms that, that grow in the clams that could, you know, introduce some, you know, devastating disease and wipe everything out. Right. So we're, we're using the same clams, but we're using the clams that have survived the 2010 freeze, that have survived all the pollution, the low oxygen rate, and, uh, and the low salinity. So these clams are they're super clams, basically. So when you're holding this vial... You got all of these. You're going to put it in the river for six or so months, and they're going to grow to a thumbnail size. Mm-hmm. Then what? Then what happens? Like you have some sort of a mat that you grow them on, or well, it's a it's a bag that they go into till they get that big. They go into the bag about the size of a pea, and you put them in the bags and cover them up with the mud and just let them sit there and grow for you know four or five months, and they'll get about the size of your thumbnail or about the size of your thumbprint, and then we that's where we're going to let them go. And okay, so go, you're just going to. Just, just let them go. There's no more growing after that. You get them to that size and then just then disperse they're on their own. them. All the little so babies are on their own. Do you just own. pour them out in a big pile or you, you kind of well, seed you want, them all over the place or what? You want to kind of keep them concentrated so they will be in the same area. So when they do get big enough to spawn, they're going to be able to have the, the – they're not spats. I'm, I can't remember what they're called, but the little baby clams. Yeah. They have to be able to, like the the sustainability I was talking about, you have to have a certain amount in a certain area. So what we're going to do is start an area and just like every week, every month that we can, you know, put 40, 50,000 clams back in the river. That's what we're going to do. And it's, it's going to be kind of a secret location right now where we're going to be putting them out because the regulations for the clams, you can still go in the, in the river and clam if there was clams, but you know, with the water pollution and whatnot, I wouldn't want to eat clams from out of there anyway, but. We just constantly keep putting them out every month, is you know until until we're done. Right, and there is no being done in sight either. I'm trying to you know keep this going and going and going. Do any of these scientists have any kind of a forecast about? Well, you know we're putting out six million this year, or or whatever that number may be. Once we get to two hundred million, we should be kind of 
you know, at a, at a, at a good point there? I mean, like, is there a goal number to get to? Well, our first goal was basically to get the project started. Yes. And we got, we came up with, they needed uh, 120,000 bucks to start the project. That was to build the, the races, which is where they, they basically seed the clams, fertilize them and get them started. So we use that money and I mean, just whatever the scientists need the money for, and it's just going to be a continuing ongoing project, just like a, a fish hatchery that they do up north. You know, that's, you know, they release 20,000, you know, little fingerlings in a lake every single year. That's not stopping. They, they do it all the time. You know, that, that money is always going to that fishery. So really getting it started was the biggest Yeah, that was the challenge. biggest step. So you, as a television host and a fishing guide and an angler and a concerned citizen, you just kind of have this idea. You you talk to some of your friends, Lisa and and whoever else. How how then does does this get off the ground? I mean, you come with some clout, so you're at a head start. But there's people all over the place that have environmental concerns, whether it's like the Captains for Clean Water guys that I mean, this is happening right in their in their bread and butter. I think it's important to try to understand how that how somebody takes action like that and gets something off the ground like what did it look like for you like you just talk about it and like you just skipped kind of right to the i raised one hundred twenty thousand dollars and got it started but there's got to be a lot of red tape and well you got to convince somebody it's con- well convincing and basically just telling my story is what did it you know growing up there in the in the banana river from ever since i can remember you know crawling i was in the in the river and just seeing it that way and telling my story about how i've seen it disappear over the past 45 years uh, in my backyard and with the sponsors that I have for the show, um, Dick Sporting Goods kicked in a good chunk of change and a lot of my sponsors, Starbright, Startron, they kicked in a lot of money. Anybody that's ever fished the Indian River and have seen seen it 25 years ago and then see it today. I've got, you know, my old clients that I that I used to take out when I was a fishing guide. Uh, and they came back and I'd send them out with you know, my buddy Travis Tanner, who was my partner in the FLW. But uh, I'd send them out with him, and they'd come back to me. They're like, man, what happened to the river? And I've, I've been hearing this for, for 15 years. What's going on with your river? What's up with the fish? Where are the fish? So I basically went to, went to CCA. We sat down with the, you know, the scientists and the head guys at FD, FCA, and we basically got it off the ground. And they needed money, and the big corporate sponsors that I have for the show kicked in quite a bit of money to get it started. And then we got a grant as well from the state. And now that now that now that it's kicked off, we got Texas looking at us. We got Louisiana, um, and all up and down the East Coast. You know, Georgia, South Carolina, North like, Carolina, and they're saying what you're doing might work yeah. where we are. Yeah, that's cool. And they have the the big clam operation up in Steenahatchee. I don't know if you ever been up there, but they have a, a huge clam operation. They get their clams down from Harbor Branch down in Fort Pierce, and they ship them up, and they're they're growing them the same way, but they're doing it for a commercial resource. And for eating clams, and all we're doing is growing them to put them in, back in the water to get our water quality back. So they already have the clam, the clam growing happening, but it's all for commercial. So we're just putting them out there for the public, really. I guess. Is there any, um, you know, when you're bringing all this to the attention of the FWC and CCA <clears throat> and all that, is there any? What's the status of the clamming industry? in your area now can it be closed down can people say we're going to try to work on it to get it closed you know for a certain amount of years but you know i enjoy going out you know getting clams and you know having a little clam bake on the beach but um as long i think if they could sustain themselves as long as the commercial guys and they they regulated it was unregulated it was the wild wild west out there when it was you know in the middle 90s you had to get to the boat ramp at like four o'clock in the morning just to get a parking space because i mean and and then you hope you don't get broken into because a lot of the clamors weren't the best people in the world out there that were out there tearing our rivers up. And so it was, it, it was just a big mess and everybody that's ever fished it and has seen that they, they know what's happening out there. And anybody that has anything to do with fishing in the industry, uh, banana river, Indian river, mosquito lagoon, we're going to try to take this project, you know, and not just in the IRL, we'll take it over to Tampa, take it down South, but <clears throat> they do have a project right now that kind of, you know, upsets me a lot because they're dumping a lot of money into it and it's not doing anything. And that's, they're putting out the oyster shells. I'm sure you've heard about the oyster project out there. Well, but a lot of people haven't. Why don't you tell me? Well, the Brevard County Zoo's got the project going where they go to the restaurants and they get all the, uh, the all the old oyster shells and put those back in the water. It sounds great, but 
what they do with those oyster shells is they lay them out in the sun, they bleach them, make sure every organism's dead on it, just like I told you with the clams. If you bring one in from, say, Mississippi or Louisiana and put it in the estuary, the oysters from all over the world come to Florida so that people can eat them, but the restaurants save the shells for the, for the oyster restoration. Mm-hmm. But when they put them out, they're dead oysters. A dead oyster doesn't filter a drop of water. Right. All it does, and if you don't have spats, if the water's not clean enough for the oyster spats to attach to the oysters, all it's going to be is a crumply piece of calcium out there in the water. Right. So why? Why? I don't understand why they <clears throat> why they think that's a good idea. Just I was thinking maybe fish structure. You know, you could create structure where there is none, but. What what does that do? Well, they they put them in the bags and they put them along the shores and it's shore restoration. And uh, yeah. I mean, and they put them along the, uh, and what really gets me is they put them along the causeways. Uh, they call them causeways. I call them dams because that's exactly what they are back in the 40s and 50s and 60s when they built the causeways through the Indian River Lagoon system. They left the bridges, yes, so boats and stuff could get through, but the, the amount of water that they stopped flowing uh, through the Indian River was, you know, it's, uh, basically that's what started killing the river was when they put the causeways in. We have no tidal flow whatsoever, really. It's all wind-driven. We're too far, the inlets are too far away from one another to get any type of flush going through the Indian River. So the only filtration system we had was the clams and the oysters. But you have to have the, the water quality first before the spats are going to be able to, you know, come up naturally like they did, you know, 100 years ago. Right. So obviously when you take away that filter, now you just got a stagnant fishbowl that yep. sits there. And, you know, everything eventually dies there yep. without filter. And one one thing that I'm trying to do, and this is the, the, the clam project is, is a small deal for me. I, I say it's a small deal. It's a huge deal for me. But uh, one of the bigger things that I see, the big picture, is when I can get in front of Ron DeSantis uh, or whoever I can get to represent uh, the environment, the good, like get in front of Ron DeSantis. But as you know, Fishing guides in Florida have to have a blanket license to cover everybody in their boat. How would you like to see one fishing guide produce $2,000 for the state instead of $203 for the state? And that would be like Louisiana, Mississippi, you know, Texas, you, you name it, every other state along the Gulf states and Atlantic. Even if you go with a fishing guide, except for Florida. Even if you go with a fishing guide, you have to buy a fishing license in Louisiana, no matter what. If you're fishing in, if you're fishing our waters, you're going to be paying. And Florida being 60% of the fishing industry, at least it was in 98 when I was doing studies and everything, but uh, <clears throat> if we were able to knock that license out and have people come down and pay $10 a day, and just to keep it simple, we'll keep it one guide, does two people a day, 100 trips. There's, there's your $2,000. And that's, that's very, very low numbers. And so they're leaving eighteen hundred dollars basically on the table with one fishing guide that does two hundred that does a hundred trips a year with two people. So we did a little study. Uh, the guys I'm working with doing this clam project and the the amount of money that can be raised a year just on inshore fishing guides could be a quarter billion dollars. And with that money, I would like to see culvert pipes go in from the ocean into Mosquito Lagoon and the Indian River into the Banana River and con- keep that, get that flow back like we had before the causeways were in. Yeah, the causeways are there to stay, but at least we can have a constant flow of fresh water coming in and out. Do you have any idea what that would cost? Is it just a little project that you just dreamed up right there? That's, well, we've, we, everybody's been talking about inlets and inlets not going to work. You'd have to, that does more destruction to the beach when you put the jetties out and it would, you know, the erosion would be bad. So, you know, culvert pipes in and out was what I've been thinking about my whole life. You know, just, you know, my brain, my fisherman brain, we get, you know, you got a bad toilet or toilet that's clogged up you flush it man <laughs> you know it's it's a cesspool in there at times and you know you got to have that clean water coming in yeah now how does it if if you did that for the you know for the fishing guides you're 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 proposing you would do that for the fishing guides all over the state of florida mm-hmm. of course each little area has its own little set of issues yep. like the everglades guides would say well that sounds good great for the mosquito goon but what about the what about the flow south you know of the water and and what about you know the the retention ponds for the for the lake okeechobee water you know full of effluent and all that is there enough money there even if it's a quarter of a billion dollars which was better than 203 dollars per fishing guide 
is there enough money and how does that how do you see that that money gets allocated to the different places that have just as immediate of a concern like well you're dealing with the government so it's like an old program you put in your computer it's plug and play pl- plug and pray <laughs> plug and pray <laughs> plug and pray so you just pray that they allot the money to the right places you know i'm giving them a source right there where they have plenty of money to do whatever they want to in the environment and it's ongoing income it's you know everybody comes to florida to fish but it's an ongoing income that could be maintained uh, i mean it, it, it create three jobs right there in one station, pumping station, for to have somebody sit there and man it. You know, I think a quarter billion dollars a year is, is a pretty good start of money. Yeah. Uh, it's it's better, like you said, it's better than zero. Right. <laughs> yeah, of course. And then for the fishing guide, in that kind of idea, they're saving $203. Yeah. I remember the times when it was lean, that $203 in January when I had to buy it. could be Man, that's, you know, that's, that's a few groceries. dinners and groceries yeah. and, you know, keeping the lights on for another month. That's right. But that, uh, you know, and then there's, the, I, I guess, with the internet and everything now, it's pretty simple. There could be an app or something that is so easy to get a fishing license. Oh, yeah. I mean, when you go to Louisiana, and I, I went out there a lot during the FLW and, I was, of course, filming shows out there. Even when I go film a show, you know, you've done it. you got to buy yeah. a fishing license. you got to. And, you know, you might sit there and complain about it, but, you know, if you want to go fish, you're going to buy a license. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the, Louisiana's got it figured out great. They, they charge you a three-day license. It's 40 bucks. If you want to, if you want to fish any other that, you got to you got to buy another three day license for forty bucks. You say, well, I might come back to Louisiana in about six or eight months. Might as well go ahead and buy a whole year license for ninety. So they sell they sell more ninety license ninety dollar licenses than they do three day licenses. I think because everybody wants to come back later in the year. Yeah, and some people go four days. Yeah, so they got to buy two of them. Yeah, yeah. they say, well, I might come back. You know, here's another that's another ten bucks or so ninety right. bucks. So they they have the money coming into their estuaries. That's one reason why red red fishing is phenomenal out there right how do you uh how do you see these times with the okeechobee uh issues and the the everglades issues and your issues in your area how does that compare to when the mullet like you just kind of touched on it that you know there used to be mullet netters all over oh yeah and then cca was really very helpful and and so was florida sportsman if i remember correctly in changing that. Yeah, Blair Wickstrom, they, the Wickstroms did a big push for that. I remember that in 95. I had my tires slashed. I had my lugs loosened up on my truck because I had, you know, vote Proposition 5. I think it was Proposition 5, the ban the nets. But, uh, yeah, just sitting at the boat ramp, I'd have that in my truck there and everything and vandalized. And I was coming down the bridge one day with my son in his baby seat, and my whole truck started shaking. I was like, what in the world's going on? I pulled off, and my, my tire, all my, every one of my lug nuts were loose. So, yeah, there's there's your commercial fisherman for you. Well, yeah, and I know they're not all bad. I used to be a commercial fisherman. I gill netted back in the back in the eighties. Yeah, and what what made the change for you? Um, I got tired of seeing dead tarpon in my nets, and you know, dead giant trout that I'd rather catch on hook and line, and um, I just saw it. It wasn't it wasn't my ticket. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Well, when they when you know when Blair Wickstrom was instrumental in in ban the nets and then that actually comes to fruition it i'm sure that you can remember and i could certainly remember when man catching redfish was really hard yeah i mean catching you could go catch a bonefish way easier than you catch a redfish yeah. and a redfish just seeing one was a was a big deal and what gets me excited and what always when i when i see what you're doing and i see what captains for clean waters doing and i see these other people that are doing these grassroots things it's like man sometimes like from the outside you could look at it and you're like man florida's a mess yeah but if you if you do something and give the environment a chance to do what it does and rebound the rebound is unbelievable and a lot of people don't don't fully understand like what happened when they banned the nets and how the redfish population rebounded to, you know, now there's multiple tournament series. Everybody's catching redfish. It's probably the most, one of the most caught fish in the state of Florida. And that, I mean, do you remember when, when that happened and when you saw like all of a sudden, Wow. Well, that was that was that happened right during the height of my guiding career when I was before the show and everything. And, like I said, I was I did everything I could to propose the the ban the nets, and it it wasn't more than a month later 
uh, I was out guiding in Banana River, and I was guiding on some tail and fish, and I, I didn't quite recognize what the tail was when it was up because, <laughs> you know, I, it's not a red fish. Maybe a black drum. No, it's not a black drum. Those are sheephead. You know, I saw a sheephead tailing on the flats for the first time, and that was like a month after the net ban. And it was I, was, I was amazed. I was like, it was one of the first times I've seen sheephead tailing. I was, probably was the first time I saw him hmm. tailing. And I was like, this is pretty cool. i never seen that before. And, you know, I, I attribute that to the nets being gone because in Banana River where I grew up, they would, you know, and I'm sure they did it in your neck of the woods down south. They'd get on a plane and their little john boats that draft about, a you know, a half a foot of water and put the net out and they did a big circle and everything in that circle. And they say they release them back in the water. Yeah, I used to say that too. Yeah, we're releasing them back in the water, but they're dead. Yeah, they've been beat up by that net. Yep. Pulled to all, you know, they purse the net. Now you got all the weight of all the other fish on top of it. That can't be, there's very little survival. Yeah. Well, I remember watching them do the gill nets. And I, like I said, I did the gill nets too. But, you know, when they were releasing fish, it's like when you, when you cast your net over a, you know, too small a bait and everything gets gilled, you get Christmas treat. How do you get it out? You basically shake them out and you're ripping the heads off, gills out. And that's exactly what they were doing with the, with the big trout and the, tarpon the little baby tarpon in there but uh yeah to get the nets gone that's that's that so was a great thing once that happened how you know obviously a couple of weeks you're seeing sheephead what do you remember about the the rebound of of the rest of the fishery oh the redfish and mullet you know we, we had our own mullet population in indian river they never left after that after the nets it just everything exploded the fishing came back it was the, like within a month you could see a difference in the fishing and schools within a of school, year. Yeah, well, within a year. Then we had the big schools of redfish that came back in that was around when I was a kid. And they came back tenfold where there was schools of three, 400 redfish. And, you know, and they're all big breeder redfish, the big 30 pounders. And, and that's going from seeing almost none yeah. to seeing those big schools within a year. Uh, within a few years, yeah. Yeah, a few years. Yeah, just a few and, years. And then it just keeps getting better. And yeah. better and better. Well, now it's not getting better. It's getting worse and worse and worse over there. Actually, it's improving a little bit because of, I think, the awareness of people not putting as much fertilizer on their lawns. You don't see as many bright green lawns out there, but just people being more aware of, you know, not putting crap in the river. Right. And that that is a big, that's a huge thing. I mean, it's easy to to blame big corporations. It's easy to 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 lay the blame somewhere else but like if you are just fertilizing the crap out of your lawn you're as big of a of a, a culprit to the river pollution as as the big corporations yeah. because you know you got 20,000 people doing that might and as well own a plantation and a lot of it's education people just don't know they, they think they got a nice br- cr- pretty green lawn there like a tortoise island over there in satellite beach area over there is one good example uh people move in they're oh, i'm on the water great look i see a mullet jump you know and oh i got a nice green lawn but you know if they if they knew the devastation that they're doing because of their nice green lawn you know the all those canal systems back when i was a kid before those were houses were built it was crystal clear water back in there oysters and uh, you can't even see the bottom in the foot. Anyway, how do you think that? How do you think that that education comes around? Because it's, it's to me, it never does any good to to shoot the guy a bird, you know, that's got the green lawn sitting out there, and you're out fishing in front of his house. It's like, what are you doing? He doesn't. And he's like, wow, fishermen are not very yeah. nice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I like those guys. Uh, they certainly don't like me. How? But but you know, there there is like what you're saying is is exactly correct. That that education is the is the basis for all change but that can come in a lot of different formats have you ever thought about like how do you like you obviously are a big thinker you're thinking about this this clam project you're thinking about you know the culverts and all this stuff what do you think about educating the uninformed and uninterested like these guys aren't fishermen a lot of times they want to play golf they want to do this or that They're, they're they just want to live on the water right they don't necessarily no, a green lawn is a status symbol. Yeah. Like, but how do you, how do you tell them that they don't have a life list of birds that they've seen? They don't have any interest in fishing. So that that seems to me to be the challenge. Like, that'd be a little bit challenge for sure. But I I would think if they're you know have a city ordinance that if you buy a you come in you buy a house here's here's your rules you need to follow. You know, if you want to help your environment out, you want to have manatees in your backyard eating on your mangroves or whatever, here's how you can help keep it that way. Or here's how you can help get it done. 
there's, I mean, Kent Fay over in Cocoa Beach, he works for a company or he's got a company that he's working for that it's a, it's, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm going over to see it. It's a machine that every, every dock owner in Brevard County and any dock owner anywhere could get this machine and it filters water and it grows, you know, it, it, it's like an osmosis treatment where it, it brings water in and lets clean water out. And I'm not exactly sure how it works. I need to be a little more educated on it. Huh. But if if every dock owner in Cocoa Beach and saddle up and down the up and down the river put this in on their dock, it would clean it. I and mean, you know, one one every fifty docks isn't gonna do it. Right. You get, it needs to be on every dock out there and it hangs off the dock and you, it you seems basically like that could be uh you know, you always got to, I always think, you know, can you bring that back to a financial thing? Could you give somebody a tax break for putting that at their dock? Could you, could you somehow incentivize them or, or, or make it to where their property is worth more on the open market if they have that? Or is there a tax break or somehow can you tie that back to somebody that really doesn't necessarily I think just shaming them, shaming them into doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't have one. You don't I have got one two. Of these. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I th- I'm not sure. Just you know, some type of a city ordinance, and it can be done easily. Just I mean, you know, oh, here's a new city ordinance. I'm buying a house. I need to do this to my dock and make it a make it a. If you're building a dock, any new dock that goes in requirement that, have to have. That's it. that's the the easy one yeah. on a new dock. Yeah. Like this is what you got to do, or if you rebuild a dock, there's there's, there's a you have to put one of these in, you know something like that. Anybody that moves into the area, as soon as you move into an area, maybe your old, maybe your you know dock's dilapidated, whatever you got to build a new dock, you have to put in one of these filtration systems. So, and they're not that expensive. I remember him telling me a little bit about it a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it sounded really interesting. And uh, the Brevard Zoo is also they they do something that. <clears throat> a lot of the people, residents over in Florida County are doing that's hanging oysters off of their docks. I know quite a few people that do the oysters on their docks, <clears throat> but 10 oysters on a dock ain't going to do much. I mean, it's a great idea, but it's not filtering that much water. The, the, you get the machines in there. There's up, up and down the St. Lucie, you know, with that green algae problem. They've created these machines that filter the water. Same thing that could be happen up here. It's just you don't get to see the blue-green algae. All you get to see is nasty water. I mean, it literally at times, Mosquito Lagoon has looked like toilet water and smelled like toilet water. But, That's not uh, good. No. How optimistic are you in your in your program? <laughs> when I cross the causeways and I'm looking at all that water, uh, north and south, as far as you can see, is you know four, three, you know, two miles wide, and as long as you can see, it, it's it's a lot of water to filter. And I'm like, my God, can can this be done? And I think it can, just as, as long as we keep, you know, pumping clams in, get the filter in there. And, uh, you know, hopefully I get to see a change in my lifetime. Well, you know, I, in my experience, it's very limited, 50 years on this planet. But when you give, it, it, you can stress the environment heavily and you give that environment a chance to respond and rebound and do what it does best. and man nothing can do a better job all we got to do is lay off it man yeah like just st- i mean putting the clams back is obviously amazing but just stop taking so damn many yeah like and and just just like the nets like stop netting the mullet and watch what happens stop you know let the water flow south from the you know f- from okeechobee into flamingo and watch what happens and I just, I, I'm very optimistic about it. I, I, I feel like, I feel like, you know, while, while it, it might be at a time in certain locations that it seems really bad, sometimes it takes something to get really bad to really bring awareness to it and get people super involved, like what you're talking about, where the city makes an ordinance yeah. about doing something like that. Oh, or for I'm- someone like yourself to envision this clam program and, actually get it going and that's to be really commended because a lot of people have ideas and a lot of people sit around and complain and a lot of people say things like they ought to do this they ought to do that and that guy that that governor's no good and this and that man that's not what you're doing yeah i finally you know i i was on that i called it i don't know if i can say it on there air say whatever you want uh the bitch table yeah sitting around you know, just bitching about the environment, complaining and complaining and not doing anything. I was on that, ta- I was on that table for a while. And, uh, finally I said, well, ain't nobody doing nothing. And, you know, time to step up. 
Right. So we did two years ago, and so it's coming to fruition right now. Man, so. that, that's that's incredible. It really is because, I mean, seriously, so many people are just bitching and moaning and complaining. It does no one any good. It really doesn't. It doesn't do anything except make other people want to bitch more. Yep. And so now you have everybody piling on. Oh, and it's really bad. And then the traffic's horrible. Yeah. And <laughs> now I'm moving. I'm leaving. Florida sucks. And all it really takes is is really someone like yourself to get it going. And then for someone to see that there has been just the the one millionth of a percent improvement being like, well, that's what I'm, I'm going with this. Now you can take all of those people that were bitching and you can channel all of that aggression and anger and frustration. That's all legitimate. Like this is, this is your life. This is your livelihood and it is being destroyed. Of course you're upset about it. But if you can just show the tiniest, tiniest bit of improvement, all of that can be channeled into something yeah. really good. Hey, it's working. Let's get more money. Right. <laughs> Let's get more clams. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and probably in that in that situation, people can see what's going on and become involved in it. Not in, not only in a way of of uh, just giving money and hoping that it goes to the right place, but you know, I mean, I'm I'm sure that there would be some way as this program progresses that, that you could have tours of growing these, these oh, clams. Yeah. Oh, this is what's happening. You're holding, like, can you imagine the power of showing a kid, letting them hold one of those vials and be like, do you realize there's 6 million clams in your hand right now? Yeah. Like, that's, that was, that, that impressed me. I was, I was amazed. And uh, yeah, we're going into the schools. I'm doing, you know, all the little fishing clubs, even if it's a, a private school with 10 kids, five kids in it. You're doing I, that now. Oh, yeah, I'm doing that now. That's wow. I'm scheduling it out for next year. We bring in the Mogan, the big RV back, and we're going cross country and, you know, spilling our beans. Dude, that's really amazing. So I mean, here, here I was trying to wind down a little bit. And <laughs> <laughs> then we got on Discovery Channel. I'm like, oh, God, you know, new audience. And we just had to step it up tenfold. So I'm, I'm in it for, for the duration. So is that, is that um, the direction of, of addicted, addictive, addictive fishing now? Is, have you, have you, I mean, you've always been a conservation guy, but have you, Except when you were a gill netter. Yeah, a gill netter. <laughs> Don't say that too loud. But have you kind of steered the ship a little more? I mean, obviously for this particular pro. But how is that going to be reflected in your program? Um, we've uh, we've done a program before with Moat Marine down in uh, down Southwest Florida out there with uh, the Snook Project. We got that that basically off the ground because I saw what happened in 2010 when we lost 75% of our snook population in Florida, and I was like, man, we got it. And I still have not killed a snook since 2010. Actually, 2009, I haven't killed a snook. But, uh, yeah, we got that project off the ground where they did, did the snook breeding program. And, and, that, and, and the problem there, just so everybody's clear, was the cold weather that yeah. that came in. We had a really debilitating cold front. It was, do you remember how cold it got oh, in Stephen, your area? Stephen Palomini called me from Boca Grande Pass down in the Keys. Yeah, Wait, yeah. No, not Boca Grande near Charlotte Harbor, but right. Boca Grande Pass down there. And he's like, Blair, I got bonefish. We're all around the boat. Their belly up, floating away, and they were they were. Dead. Saw that I saw that happen right there where where he was too, and the the Goliath grouper, the baby Goliath grouper in the back country that would go up under the mangroves. That would, used to be something that was really fun. Oh, I you used could, to love baby doing that. tarpon fish, and oh, there's a Goliath grouper, and you pitch to him, and you're catching these things that are like the biggest bass anybody's ever caught. It was really fun. It was, and they were on every single island, and then they were just simply gone yeah they were just were gone and then you know unfortunately the the biggest hit that happened on that in our area was the isla Morada bonefish yeah i mean you've done multiple shows down there where i mean i remember i going, think it was the first show i ever saw of you and i was like what is this show it's different like there's this is this is different like you're now i want to talk about that everybody but, always said i was a crazy screamer I was like, no, that's just the way i fish man <laughs> 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 but but that time. first show I think I ever saw, you were bone fishing in downtown Isla Mirada, catch a giant bone fish. But the camera angles were different, the lighting, everything about it, the editing was all different. It was fast, fast cuts, and it was just a whole different deal. But you were catching those giant bone fish. Yeah. And, you know, right after that, the giant bone fish did okay there. But then it seemed to just slow. I guess they just end up 
dying of old age, yeah, there, and they're there not was, being replaced. Yeah, there was some old ones there, that's for sure. Buddy, that was that's that's one of the craziest things ever because that is almost like a, I mean, I don't know my personal theory, and it's been other people have told me this as well, and it was explained to me by some older clients that I had. And it's like, well, what you're witnessing there in downtown Alamada is a is a stocking program by the local guides going. So you got all these bonefish tournaments, five day bonefish tournament in the fall, five day bonefish tournament in the spring. You've got all these guys, they're bringing these fish back to the same docks, weighing them and releasing them right there for 20 years. So they're going to the far ends of Key Largo. They're going to Key West and they're catching the biggest, most aggressive bonefish with the best guides in the world and the best anglers in the world, all competing to catch these big fish, all bringing those big fish back to the same dock over and over and over again and releasing them. Do you think that maybe some of those fish start spawning together or I don't know, is that why there were so many big fo- bonefish oh. there? It's an interesting theory. Definitely an interesting theory. But you know, then then again, you hear about the tagging program where they tag one in you know Key Largo and it ends up in the banks of the Bahamas. That's right. That's amazing that they do that. That's and right. Nobody ever knew that. I mean, that's 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 swimming a gauntlet right there. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, mean, all you got to do is go yellowfin tuna <clears throat> fishing over there and see the amount of sharks, uh, and you wonder how anything could make it through there. I mean, just like you say, that's the gauntlet of all gauntlets. But maybe if they pile up in a big school, they can go. Yeah, I guess. I, I remember fishing with Drew Moret down there back before he even got his captain's license and was guiding, and got the waves and waves of bonefish coming across Nine Mile Bank and out there at Sisters Keys, and uh, it was just absolutely incredible. Thousands of bonefish, waves after wave after wave, and I haven't seen that in twenty years. Yeah, it's well, been a while. The interesting thing was after that. Then you would go back to those same exact areas and it'd be waves and waves and waves of redfish. Yeah. And it would look exactly the same. A little slower. You know, here comes this rumbling wake at you. Oh, here they come. And then you throw in there and it's these really nice redfish. But And then the redfish kept moving further and further and further, you know, towards towards the Isla Mirada area into the, into the saltier and saltier and saltier and saltier water and, until eventually they're on Shell Key. Yeah, and you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I remember I was fishing with Drew down there, and uh, red fishing up in my neck of the woods, pulling around looking for red fish. Was you know, I'd see a thousand in a day in Mosquito Lagoon, and we get down there, and I'm, we're looking for bonefish. All of a sudden, Drew gets all excited because there's a red fish. He, you know, it was like the fifth red fish he'd ever seen on the flats out there, and he got all excited. I'm like, you know, screw the red fish, go bone. He's like, no, let's get your red fish. I'm like, no, let's go bone fishing. <laughs> and that was that was incredible. Down to see him get to see Drew Murray get that excited about a about a redfish on the flat well, you know Drew's a guy that that has grown up down there and seen everything and and when you see something different or something that you've never seen before i mean it's the first time he's ever seen a fit that fish on that flat super exciting yeah and there's almost this thing like we have to catch that so that i can hold it in my hand and make sure that it's what i actually saw yep. like and but but that that certainly changed and the redfish really piled in there um, and then now the bone fishing is really good where the bone fishing wasn't yep. in Key West. Uh, you know, I mean, there's bone fishing in Alamada. It's good. I just did a great show down there with Brandon Sear and his brother, Jared, last year catching, we did a slam and I mean, this, the Sear brothers, that's all I call them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, uh, you know, that, and, and that, one thing I've always said, you know, if, if, what has happened to the estuaries all over Florida, if it were to happen overnight, what's happened over the past 30 years, we would have had all kinds of money because the government would have came in. It would, it's an environmental disaster that's taken 45, 50 years to happen. But if, it would, if you were to step back in time and then come to, right to today, you would be like, why in the hell did you let this happen? That's what I say. Why did we let this happen? And so when you say this happened, is I mean, there's so many things that happen. What do you when when you say that yourself? What do you put your finger on? Why do we let this happen? Pollution. I mean, why did we let the environment go to hell? I mean, it was it's you know w- it, without the environment we're going to die. I mean, without a clean environment we end up dying. So yeah. why why do we we're basically killing ourselves? When I look at it, man, you, you, from what I've seen. When I was a kid to now, like I said, if it happened overnight, we'd have 
you know, every environmental study over with and we, we, we wouldn't be in the situation we're at today. How much of that do you think is, is just the fact that there's 10 times more people living in the state of Florida? I don't know. Look at the Great Lakes. How many people live around there? Very interesting. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, they complained about invasive species. There's the, the zebra mussel, but I think the zebra mussel saved the Great Lakes. Huh. A little tiny mussel. Yep. You know, when it was basically Lake Erie would burn. And in my lifetime, it's back to crystal clear. I see Mark Zona doing shows out of there now catching giant uh, smallmouth bass in 30 feet of water, crystal clear, so looking clear. at boulders. So, I mean, it can it can happen in our lifetime. We just got to get off our butts and get it done. Well, that's, again, man, that's what I commend you for is that you're you're actually doing something. And, and there's other organizations that are actually doing something. Caps for Clean Water decided can't. Do you can't watch this anymore. Yeah. Like, this is somebody has to do something about it. And instead of sitting around bitching about somebody doing something about it, it's like somebody's got to take the reins. I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I can yeah, imagine I that that's what you're saying. Like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm at least going to give it a shot. I just do it on observations. I saw what came out when it died. Got to put it back in to reverse the situation. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope that. I mean, I, I wish you all the best of luck with that thing, and you're going to take it. You, you, you've obviously got a lot of tools that you can that you can use, um, but it's it's really something that you've gotten that off the ground. I want to I want to talk about your show a little bit before before we run out of time, because like I said, the first time I ever saw your show, I'd heard uh, there's this new show, uh, Addictive Fishing, you know, and I think the first one I saw was the Bonefish one, and I was like, whoa, that is different, like. What's the what's the whole startup story of your show? Well, I, I was in the Air Force for four years. As I'll give you, you were? A, uh, yeah, I'll give you a little a little history of my background. I did the, I did BCC, which is Brevard Community College, for a couple of years after high school. Decided, eh, college ain't my thing. So I joined the Air Force for uh, four years, and I got to travel the world, fish all over the place doing that. And uh, military had saved my life, I can tell you that right off the bat. And no more commercial fishing after that. So. Got out of the Air Force and uh, worked on the space shuttle for about five years and decided I was done with the government contracts. I was done working for the government. All, all that, you know, wondering, you know, if the shuttle goes up, if, you know, something happens, you're going to lose your job. So I was working third shift out there and started a fishing guide, you know, program. I was, you know, want to be a fishing guide. So I started, you know, guiding people and it ended up where I started making more money being a fishing guide than I was working for NASA. So I uh, quit my job out at the Cape and went full bore into fishing guide. And uh, after about 10 years of that, my body started breaking down. I figured, well, I got to do something because I don't want to be a fishing guide the rest of my life. You know, I've been talking to the guides down there in uh, Almorada for years. And now you need to do something else. You got to have a side job. So I started thought, well, you know, I did a couple of shows with uh, O'Neill Williams, Mark Sosin, a lot of local guys. And I said, man, I can, I can run my mouth and catch fish. That ain't no problem. <laughs> So uh, then the School of Hard Knocks of Marketing came in. <laughs> yeah, that's the part people don't understand. It's like, it seems like it's really hard to catch fish with a camera boat. I'm always like, uh, that's the easiest yeah, part. Yeah, that's of what the we easiest do. part. And then, Let me tell you, that's definitely the easiest part. So we uh, we started a little pilot, and uh, my childhood friend from second grade, Kevin McCabe, I went to him. He had a production company, and he was actually doing government contracts as well. And he was getting sick of government contracts. So I said, well, hey, let's start a fishing show. I've been a fishing guide now for about 12 years. I think I can, you know, I think I can do this. So he sat and camera out with me, and it was just me on the boat at first. And I said, no, we need a guest. I'm going to, you know, I was a guide. I want to promote the guide industry because it's sink or swim. You know, you're, you're busy for three months, and then you might not take a charter for a month. So I said, I want to help the guide industry out. I'm going to go with nothing but full-time guides to support these guys because, you know, once they, once the TV show, you know, airs, just like what happened with me with Mark Sosin, I did the show with him. I never had to advertise again. I had thousands of phone calls from this and, uh, you know, said, so I can do this. So anyway, we started a pilot and I just basically went out to, uh, some of my sponsors that I had as a fishing guide, Hughes Maverick Pathfinder at the time and, uh, Minn Kota, Sam Heaton when he was still young and <laughs> if you know Sam, yeah, but just a, a few little sponsors and I think I raised like 40 grand the first year and we got it off the ground and you know bought our airtime and uh basically the rest is history after we hit the airwaves our first show it was I mean that was when Florida Sportsman Forum was going on and 
you know, I'd go read everybody what they'd put up, and they'd be what like, "What network yeah, were you on that first year?" Sunshine, sunshine. Yeah. So it's just Sun Sports on Florida. Yeah. Okay. And and then you're going to those forums there. And- yeah, going to the forums, and I would read what people were were saying. I wouldn't get on there and char- you know say anything unless you know somebody tried to roast me or something. <laughs> <laughs> and that Florida Sports and Forum was really known for that back then, getting yeah. roasted. But uh, you know, there was out of a hundred comments, there might be one roast, and then somebody else would jump in. Ah, oh, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. But uh, and it just kept building from there, building from there, and. You know, it's, well, one of the things that I noticed that you you did, and I've I followed your career from the the very beginning, you know, because I didn't have when I first saw your show, I didn't have aspirations of having a television show. But then, of course, when I did, I look at everything, yeah. right? So, Shaw, I had the same experience that you did with Mark Sosen. I had the same experience with Shaw Grigsby. I did a Barracuda show with Shaw Grigsby. It aired on New Year's Day, and buddy, there still to this day. There has never been anything in my entire fishing career that elicited that kind of response. It was on TNN. Yep, TNN then, was it. And that was, I mean, there might have been a million people watching that. Yeah. And there's nothing that gets those kind of ratings. And it was back in the days of the answer machine. And you come home <laughs> and it's like full, 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 full. What in the world? I didn't even know it aired. Yeah. I've never seen an answering machine full. So you start listening. Hey, Barracuda, Barracuda. I saw this. I saw that. I write all those down, clear the machine, start making phone calls, come home the next day, full, 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 full. We don't need double answering machine, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I, that's where I first saw the power of television. But what I was going to say is, I, you know, in following you, you've always done a really good job of being extremely accessible to your to your following. You have these... I don't know if they were weekend events or somewhere where you would go and be with all these people. Then you had your, your Mogan forum, your own forum yeah. for a long time. Yeah. We had that. And then, you know, I guess everything progresses. Everything <laughs> progresses. I had a forum too, because, you know, Blair <clears throat> Wiggins has a forum. I need a forum too. And, you know, my, I'm going to be different than, than you because like I didn't had didn't have as much going on as you. So I had actually time to sit down and, and talk to all these people, roasting or not roasting or whatever. There yeah. was no reason to roast me. They, they I, I wasn't on television <laughs> like you were. So, um, but then it just got just infested with spam to, to the point that I couldn't even control it yeah. at all. Is that what happened to your oh, forum? Yeah, yeah, and you just the moderators. There was some. We you'd make a moderator, and they'd put their friends in charge of it. And next thing you know, there's illicit pictures on right. your forums and so we shut that down we still got a mogan lounge that people go to and post pictures right now but uh, it was nothing like the forums but uh the good old days like I yeah said. well what about the how about the um the events that you would have i was always kind of like wow look what he's doing here <laughs> well at the end of the at the end of our second season i think it was and everybody was expecting you know when's the dick the fishing coming back out well looking on the forums but at the end of the second season i was just like i jumped on florida sportsman forum and i said hey i'm gonna be down at rufus wakeman's place this weekend i'm just you know blowing off steam we're done with the season and God, next thing I know, Rufus called me up. What the hell is going on? Because <laughs> he, I, I put that post up and he sold out immediately. I, I didn't even have my room, but somebody canceled. I was able to get my room down there, but I just posted on there. Hey, I'm going down to, you know, anybody wants to come hang out and go fish? And it was just something like that. I posted on the forum. Next thing I knew, it was like, boom, Mogan Mania. What are we doing? And then it, it turned into, I mean, an absolute zoo at one point. Hmm. We had uh, bands from Nashville come down and, and set up. We had, I don't know if you ever heard of Hasty Dixie, <laughs> uh, but they were a bluegrass band that uh, they do all like ACDC, Ozzy Osbourne, yeah, they do a remix, bluegrass. and they are good. Today that, they would do Snoop Dogg. Like, oh, yeah, they actually like did Snoop Dogg. That, they did one of his Chin and Juice. Yeah. yeah they Is that, that them? I them. love them. Yeah. I love that song. My son loves that song, like his that that rendition of it. I thought it was somebody else. but There's there's two bands out there that did it. The Gourds Yeah, did it. yeah, yeah. That's the one that, that then, I've heard. But, but everybody thought it was Hasey Dixie that did yeah. it, so Hasey went ahead and did it. And cool. It sounded just like the version the Gourds did. Yeah. Except awesome. with John Wheeler's voice, man. John Wheeler's voice is absolutely incredible. He's yeah. So why would why would they come to your your deal? Did you know them, or did they just were they a fan of the show? They were fans of the show. Plus, my cousin Shane was in, big in Nashville up there, uh, playing a fiddle, and uh, he got to know these guys, lived with them, and you know, <laughs> he, he was always telling me, "Man, you need to get these guys down here, man. You need to get them down there. Great." And so we, I ended up meeting them, and 
they came down a couple times and God, it was just an absolute, we had, we did it at Dockside Marina, that one. And we had the band set up it was before Dockside did all their changes before the hurricane destroyed it down there. And the Coast Guard actually pulled up out there and dropped anchor to watch the show. I don't know <laughs> if they dropped anchor, but the whole basin out there in front of Dockside people, it was a, it was a full blown concert. Wow. I mean, it was people coming from everywhere. So what do you do with that? Like you, you've got that. How do you, how do you manage that? Like, what do you? That's why we don't do it. No more. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was getting way too big and out of hand, but, uh, it was, you know, then it turned into, you know, bring your own dish and, you know, we kind of toned it way back. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it literally turned into a job in itself, just getting planning that one for the whole year. And I was like, mm, yeah, no more. At some point, you know, it pulls you away from everything else that you're, that you're, you're trying to do, including your family. Um, yeah, but now what now what we're doing, and I'm glad you brought that up, October 5th, uh, I'm doing a fundraiser for the Clam Restoration Project. This will be the phase two. Our first phase one, we surpassed it because our, our goal was two million clams, and now we got six. We even had to employ some of the guys up in the commercial industry of it to raise half of our clams for us because we didn't have enough room. But uh, October 5th uh, in Cocoa Beach, I'm sorry, in Cocoa, downtown Cocoa at the uh, Cocoa Civic Center, we're going to have a like a it, it's a one-nighter it's going to be a fundraiser it's going to be kind of like a cca banquet setup we do silent auction raffle prizes and then a, a regular auction and uh raising money for clams so that's that's kind of what my mogan mania is going to turn into is you know a fundraiser to put back into the environment it's kind of cool, what we're man. looking at well as that approaches let me know i'd, I'd like to I'd like to come and well, we're gonna nothing do, else. Just sit we're gonna there. Do, we're gonna do <laughs> we're gonna have celebrity uh, celebrity tables. So yeah. I'm more than welcome to have somebody come and uh, sit at a table with you. You're invited. I wanted to get with you anyway. Yeah, and get you to come down. And, well, I, uh, I mean, I, if if you can do anything with whatever small amount of success and people knowing who you are, if you can, in my opinion, if you can channel that towards helping to make sure that someone's grandchildren are going to be able to do the things that we like to do. Yeah. I'm all about it. Well, I've, I've kind of told people I'm going to have a good list. I'm going to have a bad list. Everybody that's on the good list are people that have donated their time, money, energy, something to the clams, the bad list. You don't want to be on the bad list because <laughs> I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell people, I'm going to tell people who donated and who did not donate. Well, you know what though, that, that, I, that you, I, you need to be able to make sure that, you know, everybody's busy. Everybody's doing their own thing. Everybody has little issues that they might be working on. You need to make sure that you're 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 giving everybody an opportunity. Oh yeah, everybody's got a chance. I'll be doing PSAs. Already got uh, Sun Sports is going to do PSAs for me. Um, news groups, uh, uh, sorry, the news channels. I'm going to get with these the news channels. They've already you know heard about it. So I just need to get my my full spiel down when I get in front of the news cameras and. Start talking about Somehow, the I don't think that's going to be difficult for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I still get nervous in front of the damn camera. Oh, I get I nervous mean, in front of everything. I, I get mean, nervous before we do a podcast. I was oh, nervous yeah. before we started this. Are you kidding? That, that little light blinking in front of you. are like, ah. then you got to get up in front of an audience, do seminars. I always said it was, you know, I was more scared than they were because, I mean, it's like you've got all these eyeballs looking back at you and it's a lot easier with a red flashing light than. Yeah, but I can, I can assure you that from the other side, because I've seen you do those things, it looks effortless and it looks like you were born to do it and. You know, and anyone that's good at something like that. But I think that if you probably ask any of those people, they just about threw up beforehand. Oh yeah, I mean, and, yes. Yesterday, I had to get up and you know the middle of the stage there on F on the in the convention center, and just start spewing about the clam deal. Hey, right. everybody, come listen. To it. You know, and it's right. Do you find that it's the hardest when there's nobody there? Like, uh, like for me, if if we had something, and your 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 event there. Say there's 2,000 people there, and you ask me to get up and say something. And it's a room full of 2,000 people. I could do that, no problem. But if, if, if they said, I want you to go do a casting demonstration right now on the casting pond, and there's nobody there. But once you start, it'll, you know, people, that would just yeah, tear that me up. Oh, that uh, I had to do that at the Miami Boat Show. You know, you can't, you're not allowed to have a loudspeaker back when it was in the convention center and all that. So... I was with uh, Mercury at the time, and they said, you know, you need to get up and do a seminar. Get people here in the booth. What, what am I supposed to do? You know, 
Tell is, people, anyone, is anyone going to announce me yeah, or anything yeah, like that? No, nope, just stand up there. Just get up on the boat. That is the hardest. Oh, it was tough. Oh, I got up. The hardest. I said, you know, what the heck am I going to do? Okay, I know what I'll do. Hey, does anybody want to learn how to catch more fish? And sure enough, people came in, came in, and that's and that's how I kind of start all my when I have to do that now. That, that's my line is, hey, anybody want to learn how to catch more fish? And you get one or two people stop, yeah, and, and then a crowd brings a crowd. Yeah, right. But man, that is that, that is scary. definitely the hardest. <laughs> I, I'm with you there, man. Like, like like you're just standing there screaming like a crazy person in the middle of the Miami boat show, and you know if you're not wearing some kind of jersey or something, you're just wearing regular clothes. People just Oh, That's this is crazy, dude. Well, this was back before. This was years ago at the Miami Boat Show, and this was before jerseys. And right. I mean, every once in a while, you see a bass guy walk. Oh, that's a bass guy. He's a bass right, right. Or NASCAR. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was. They were way out of place. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah, standing up there with just a little Mercury shirt on and screaming, "Who is this guy?" Right. And then if they listen long enough, you might learn something. Yeah. But that's the hardest. So, um, you're the Mogan man. What is a Mogan? Uh, it's the biggest fish of the day, biggest fish of your life. It's, the, you know, whatever, kind of whatever you want it to be. It'd be a Mogan boat. It'd be a giant boat. Uh-huh. But that obviously comes from somewhere. That's your term that you coined and made very popular. It's kind of a cross between monster and biggin. Uh, my, my producer was from New York. <laughs> <laughs> he just couldn't say biggin. Yeah. So he called them monsters and I called them biggins and somehow it just, it's a Mogan. Uh-huh. So it just turned into Mogan. I don't know how it did, but, you know, <laughs> with a funny, one of the funniest stories that I got after our first year and we we're, you know, after our first show aired, we were pretty popular. I was just amazed at, you know, the, the response that we got. And, uh, that was our first year. And then, uh, Mogan mania, we had that little get together I told you about, and it was just, you know, announcement on the Florida sports forum. This guy shows up and he's got a tattoo on his leg <laughs> <laughs> of, a, of a giant fish hook and the word Mogan on his leg and i'm like dude you, you better hope it. you better hope our show's popular one <laughs> you day made because a terrible ain't, mistake ain't nobody gonna know what a mogan is but he see you know he shows it off now and everybody knows what a mogan is it's a you know i, I said that when i first started to my buddy who was big in the bass and uh he goes man you need to call them lunkers i'm like everybody knows what a lunker is it's a freshwater bass you know so we don't have a name for a saltwater fish a uh, big saltwater fish and so ended up being Mogan. Yeah. And so everybody started calling me the Mogan man. I don't know. It's just, uh, it, it stuck. Yeah. yeah. It worked for you, man. And now you've, you've, uh, you might make it into the dictionary one day. <laughs> <laughs> urban dictionary. Yeah. Anyway, you could right? probably be on the urban dictionary, but maybe not even for what you want to be on. Therefore. <laughs> Another funny story about two years after that, I was at the, uh, it was at River Palm Cottages just down there for the weekend. And this dude comes walking up to me and he goes, how you doing? My name's Bill Mogan. Uh oh! Is <laughs> there goes, a lawsuit coming? Goes, You're using my name. I said, "Oh, dude, I'm sorry. It's just something my call fish." He goes, "Don't worry about it, man. I love it." <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but his actual last name was Mogan. Wow. Was he a uh, big guy? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was probably lucky on that. <laughs> well, that's cool, man. Um, so, you got anything else cooking? Uh, what, what what's the status of the show right now? Like, where is it? The status you... of the show is we're on Sun Sports right now. We've been on Sun Sports for 21 years now. And uh, I think Murphy's got the only oldest show out there now on on the uh, on the airwaves. But uh, we've been on there 21 years. Just started on Discovery Channel last year, and it was a great hit for us. We're the number three show. It was you know, like I said, I was wanting to kind of tone it down a little bit. Then Discovery came along, and they uh, renewed us for two more years on Discovery. So we'll be that 7:30 time slot Saturday mornings. Mm. Man, I think we're right after you. Yeah, yeah, I think you are. Yeah, that's great uh, because always all of the people that are talking the the airtime and everything like that, I'm like, look, we're interested, but who leads in and who leads out? Because if you create, like if you have a bass show and a saltwater show and a walleye show and a, and a, and a whatever and a bigfoot show <laughs> then it's like naked and nobody's afraid. gonna watch like but if you can get like a block of like type shows yeah then it always does better it does better for everyone it does better for the network it does better for you for me for for everybody but you know so i always liked on on, on espn they used to have saltwater saturday yeah or, or saltwater sunday and whatever they did on saturday but it was they would put all the saltwater stuff at one time I felt like the ratings were always better like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And plus, the, well, back in VCR days, you hit your recorder, you record it for three hours. That's what I did when I was out fishing, come home at night, and then watch it. Yeah. 
but Man, things showing have changed. my age, Anna. Yeah, well, things have changed. How how have you um, adapted? I mean, you were an early adopter of the internet, of the forums, of and I'm sure of social media when when that happened. But as the television habits change, how have you adapted to that? It it has definitely. Ooh. Supposed to speak at CCA in ten minutes. Okay, well, let's wrap it up. <laughs> let's get this. Um, one more time. Uh, I was just asking how you've oh, adapted the social to it, media and that's group. a lot. That's a whole other podcast. Oh my god! So you got to go. I know that. Tell everybody how they can get in touch with you, where they can see your show, what you're up to, how they can be part of this clam thing. And check us out, especially the clam deal. It's I Indian River Clam Restoration dot com. IRL Clam Restoration dot com. Uh, there's going to be uh, flyers at every bait shop. I mean, if you can donate money, it, yeah, you can donate, donate money right there. Donate time. Uh, you know, like I said, a big fundraiser we're doing in October. Uh, you go to our website at dickofishing.com. If you can't, if you don't see a poster or you don't hear about it, you're either six feet under or you're locked in the car somewhere because everybody in Brevard County is going to know about this thing coming up and hopefully it's going to spread like I said we got a lot of people from around the country looking at this project and if it works and it's a success then I'll be a hero if it's not a success I'll be a zero no (laughs) you're never going to be a zero you got it started and you did more than more than most people do so you never be a zero in my book that's very commendable you got my number text me call me tell me how i can be involved what i can do i'm more than happy to help you out sounds good brother i appreciate it thank you blair and uh see you on the water all right see you